If the Buddha had a Vipassana technique, it was never recorded. All we see of Vipassana in the canon is that it's a quality of mind that you bring to the practice of concentration together with samatha, or calm. And it's also a quality of mind that's developed through the practice of concentration. And the Buddha says you develop it by asking questions. And the questions are these. How should fabrications be regarded? How should they be understood? How should they be abandoned through discernment? Fabrications here is the translation of Sankara. And the Buddha's answer is in another sutta where he talks about seven things you do with anything that comes up and the mind is clinging to. And you don't wait until you're in deep concentration in order to do these things. You can look at anything you're clinging at any level. Ideally, samatha, calm, and vipassana insight should be developed together. But different people have different proclivities. Some people like to think things through and analyze things first. And so they will do the analysis and then kind of back up and work on some more calm. Other people find it easy to get the mind into a good, calm state, and then they have to work out analyzing things. But ideally, the two processes go together, because you're not going to get the mind into good, solid concentration until you understand the processes of fabrication going on here in the present moment. The way you breathe is a kind of fabrication. The way you talk to yourself is another kind. The feelings and perceptions that look around the mind. Those are another kind of fabrication, too. And when you're getting the mind into concentration, you're going to be using all those fabrications. You're going to be talking to yourself about the breath and using perceptions, images you hold in mind about where the breath comes in, where it goes out, where you are focused in the body. That's a perception for the sake of giving rise to feelings of well-being, ease. So as you get the mind to settle down, you'll find that other fabrications are getting in the way. Those are the ones you want to clear away. And that's where you do a little vipassana, a little insight with them. And basically those questions come down to which fabrications are worth holding on to and which ones are worth letting go. Because you don't let go of everything all at once. If you did, you wouldn't be sitting or meditating. You'd just be out lying in the field someplace. There are certain things you got to hold on to, but you find that something comes in and distracts you from meditation, you can ask yourself, well, how does that come? How does it go? Those are the first two questions the Buddha has you ask. And in the coming, it's not just arising, it's what causes it to arise? What's the nourishment? What's the oomph it gives to you? Some things arise simply through the past karma, but if you take them on, it suddenly becomes your present karma, and that's what you want to look into. Otherwise, the things arise and they just pass away like little blips. But once something starts turning into a story, okay, you're implicated. So you have to ask yourself, why did you want to get involved? And then you notice when whatever it was that you thought you were getting out of it no longer interests you, you let it go. That gives you some insight into what's going on. And then the next questions are, What's the allure? Why would you want to get involved with that? What are the attractive features? Or what does the mind tell you that you gain out of this particular distraction? And you want to weigh that with the drawbacks. Now, sometimes the mind lies to itself. There are things we go for and we're not all that proud about why we go for them, so we muffle them up, cover them up. But you gain glimpses every now and then. And one of the best ways of gaining a glimpse of what's the allure is to say, no, I'm not going to go there, and see what part of the mind objects, rebels. And it may give a little bit of reason why it wants to rebel. You want to look for that, because that's where you'll see the allure. 
ultimate is when you really, really understand what the allure is and you compare it with the drawbacks. There's going to be some dispassion. That's the purpose of Vipassana, is dispassion. So you can let go through knowledge. Not just because you tell yourself to let go, but because you understand. And the mind gets back to concentration. So the level of understanding you're going to have will depend on the level of your concentration. It's not that you wait until a certain level of concentration and then you start analyzing things. Your discernment and your concentration grow together. You have this level of concentration, will you be able to see things with this level of clarity? And that will enable the mind to get more still. And then as the mind gets more still, you see other things with more clarity. And the two qualities grow together. So there's no hard and fast rule about when you start doing vipassana or when you stop doing samatha. You do them together in the process of trying to get the mind to settle down. Then you should begin to get into the jhanas. It's the same sort of thing. To move from one to the next, you have to see what's the drawback of the state of concentration I've got here. Don't be too quick to take it apart. You want to get so that you can attain it at will before you start taking it apart. In the Buddhism, you want to be like an archer who's good at shooting great distances, shooting big masses, firing arrows in rapid succession. In other words, you want to get really good at it. And then you can ask yourself, okay, what in here is still unstable? What in here is still a disturbance in the mind? Again, it's the same sort of questioning. What in here is no longer worth holding on to? Vipassana is a kind of value judgment. See what's worth holding on to, what's not. Now when you detect some, some instability in the concentration that doesn't have to be there, like in the first stage you've been thinking about the breath and adjusting the breath, there comes a point where as a John Fuhrman would say, it's like putting water into a jar. The water fills the jar at some point, and then no matter how much more water you put in the jar, it's not going to get any more full than that. The same way you can adjust the breath up to a point, and then it's not going to get any better than that, so you might as well settle down with what you got. You can drop all the adjusting and just be with the breath. This is where the sense that you are one thing and the breath is something else begins to disappear, to begin to merge. You're one with the object. It fills the body. Okay? Maintain that. Steady the mind there. And only when it's really good at that do you start taking another look at what else could be let go as well. So it's stilling and questioning, stilling and questioning. These two things go back and forth. It's like washing your hands. Your left hand washes your right hand, your right hand washes your left. As you keep on washing, they get cleaner and cleaner. Your discernment develops your concentration, your concentration develops your discernment. They get clearer, more still. into the point where the, the two activities are not quite so separate anymore. You see this in the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation. He divides it into sixteen steps, and the sixteen steps get divided into four tetrads. And in the first three tetrads, the basic principle is you get sensitive to the fabrication going on, say, in the body, or with feelings, or with the mind. And then you calm it. So you're doing both vipassana and seeing things in terms of fabrication, and then samatha in terms of the calming. You begin to see that the two processes go well together. It's when they go well together like this that they can really do their work. It's simply a matter of which you want to emphasize at any one particular time. And that will require that you gain a, 
a sense of what's going on in your mind, learn how to read your mind to see what it needs. Because insight is not simply a matter of putting the mind through a ringer. Bombarding it with the questions you're told to bombard it with. You start with those questions, but then you get more sensitive to see exactly what do they mean in terms of your mind, your body, your feelings. And it's a sensitivity that becomes your insight. After all, this is a quality of the mind. It's clear seeing. And you want to get more sensitive to your feelings and your body as you feel it from within, and your awareness in the body. Those first three frames of reference in right mindfulness, those are precisely the things that need to come together for the mind to get in a good, strong state of concentration. Your awareness, the mind fills the body. A sense of ease, pleasure, or equanimity fills the body. Those are the main elements. This is how mindfulness and concentration come together, how right effort and concentration come together. Vipassana and Samatha come together. They all merge. And it's when they merge that they can do good work in the mind.